the compound. One. Satcha was taken to a military facility, past the Ural mountain range into the region of the West Siberian plain. He was picked up by car. At a certain time, on a certain street corner, by instruction from his new keeper, Malachi Avon. At first, it was a bit thrilling, but as the day fell, he had been loaded up in a large gray bus with military insignia, along with 19 other youths. They were all told to keep quiet, that their journey would be long by an instructor in uniform. Darkness had fallen hard by the end of the day. White snow had begun to layer the landscape as the nearly 10-hour trip carried on. Satcha felt the temperature in the bus getting colder as the time passed. He was seated by the window, and he had nothing but sparse, flat landscape to keep his mind going. They had begun their journey in the mid-morning, and it was nearly midnight when they arrived. The bus pulled into a lane, cut away from the main road, and it seemed to be a mile long. The compound loomed like darkened prison. It reminded him of a fortress in medieval times. High walls stood as a barrier with corner towers. Spotlights lit the night as the bus drove down the entrance to the front gate. Guards with assault rifles strapped to their shoulders stopped the bus at the wrought iron gate and checked paperwork given from the driver. The military instructor conversed with the guards and after a few minutes, the gate was opened and the bus lunged forward in low gear. It arrived inside an opened arena for vehicles and stopped. The instructor stood up and announced, stand up and exit the bus. Stand in single file beside the bus and wait further instruction. All 20 youths remained quiet and exited the bus. They came to stand beside the bus in the bristling wind. Two staunch, middle-aged people were standing on the landing of cement stairs that appeared to be the entrance to this colossal structure. It was a man and a woman. They were dressed in impeccable green and gray uniforms and looked straight ahead as if waiting for the right moment to speak. The man announced loudly, I am Viktor Petrov. I will be your headmaster during your stay at our learning facility. You should be proud that you have been elected to serve our great motherland, and we will do our best to instruct you and teach you to protect yourselves and our great nation. We will make you strong, both physically and mentally, in order to be your very best at your work in the future. The woman then cued in. I am Ingrid Solonoff headmistress of this great learning facility. As Master Petrov has explained, we are here to enhance your education and your skills. The weak will not survive here. She paused for a moment. The weak will not survive anywhere in this world. I am not soft because I am a woman. Do not be fooled. I am hard but fair. Those foolish will be punished skillfully in order to learn. Welcome. Two. In orderly fashion, they were marched into the dark concrete building, one by one, then separated from male to female in a large hallway. Once this was done, and the genders were split, each group were told to go with individual instructors. They were brought to a large mess hall that was dimly lit and run through a cafeteria, where they were given IRPs on a tray and a bottle of water. They were told to sit, eat in silence, and they only had ten minutes to complete the task. Once they had done this, they were gathered back in orderly groups, according to gender, and they were marched down long, meandering hallways with single glass-sealed bulbs as their only source of light. Everything was painted a slick gray color, walls, ceilings, floors, just like a prison. Satcha had imagined. Finally, they entered a barracks, still lined up in single file against a wall. Each young man was given a duffel bag containing clothes, and they were told that in the morning, gray sweats were required to be worn. 
they were told to choose a bunk. That lights out was in seven minutes. They were told to get some sleep. Time was 12, 48 a.m. 3. At 5.02 a.m., Satcha opened his eyes. He knew they were coming. Two young military instructors stormed into the barracks, holding the tops to aluminum trash can lids, and they were banging them with batons. Satcha looked around. It was nearly light outside, but the overhead lights masked the windows because his eyes hadn't adjusted to the surroundings. He leapt out of bed and waited in stunned silence for only a few moments. Get dressed, one shouted. Get up, you stupid retards, another shouted. You think you're something special, don't you? Get dressed. Sacha got dressed as fast as he could, putting on the white T-shirt, then the gray sweatshirt top, then the pull-up trousers with the drawstrings, then the socks, and then the tennis shoes. He came to the front of the bunk and stood at attention. He was the first. The others straggled behind. They got berated. One got hit in the gut. Most of them, including Satcha, were ridiculed to the point. It was ludicrous. They were brought out to the back of the compound. They were instructed to run around the mile track that had been laid out. It was roughly 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and the wind was blowing at about 10 miles an hour. Satcha remained silent. He heard the moans and the ruffled grunts from the other young men. It was bitterly cold. But Satcha saw how these two instructors, probably in their early twenties, were wearing nothing but T-shirts and sweats. They told them to run at a pace they could hold, and that they would be marked for their performance and measured each day. Satcha ran three-quarters of a mile before giving up, his chest burning from the cold air, his heart beating like a racehorse. In the far distance, he could see and hear the instructors screaming and berating the other ten bunkmates he had inherited. They were all cold strangers to him. In some weird, unattached fashion, Satcha just watched and felt nothing for them. They were weak. They were allowed to eat breakfast at a quarter past seven in the morning. It consisted of porridge, sausage, and eggs, and black tea. Satcha thought, at the time, he had eaten the most marvelous breakfast of his lifetime. After breakfast, they were brought to the gymnasium, where they performed calisthenics until 11 a.m., then given free time in the barracks until 12 noon. Thereupon, they were marched to the cafeteria for light lunch. Then off to classes. The classes began in Russian history. Politics expectations of new KGB operatives, and in psychology. From 5 to 6 p.m., they ate dinner at the mess hall. From 7 to 9 p.m. was free time in the barracks, then lights out. This roster schedule ran consistent for the first six weeks. 4. By the end of six weeks, Sacha could run continuous for an entire mile. Every week, the temperature fell five degrees. He was running in only a T-shirt by then. There had been eleven young men and nine young women who had entered the program on that dark night. Next to the last week of October 1990, five young men and only three of the girls remained. Very slowly, the two gender groups were allowed to mingle. It began in the classrooms, during the long sessions and the lessons given in politics, psychology, and history. In the beginning week of December, instead of pure exercise in the morning, hand-to-hand -hand combat had been added. Sacha thought it interesting on how they had spent time building up their bodies in order to be strong enough to fight. It made sense to him. Five. Friday, December 21st, Sacha was told that he had a visitor. It was in the evening time. The boys were in a lounge room by the barracks when Sacha was called out. He was led to a conference room by an instructor. Inside the room, 
Seated at the oval table was Malachi Avon. Malachi stood up when he saw Satcha. He smiled big and held out a hand to be shook. Satcha shook his hand firmly and held at attention as Malachi sat down again. Please sit, Malachi voiced. I forgot how strict this place was. Satcha took a chair and looked at him serenely. Malachi grinned. You look like you've grown three inches since I last saw you. Satcha cocked his head and grinned slightly with amusement. They tell me you are doing an excellent job. Thank you, sir. How do you like it here? Malachi asked. Satcha nodded. I like it. It's just school. Like going off to boot camp for the army. Malachi laughed. Yes, you are right. You have the mindset for this, don't you? Satcha nodded. Malachi leaned forward, looking serious now. Everyone in our league comes here in the beginning. Even I did my tenure, many decades ago. It's a rite of passage. Are you like me? Satcha wondered. No, Malachi explained. I'm more of an erotic politician. Satcha grinned. Anyway, I wanted to come in person and have a visit, to let you know that you are not forgotten, and that the future awaits when you return. When will that likely be? Satcha asked. I will be back to gather you on first Friday of February. Satcha nodded. That's when the next phase of your development will start. Satcha sat up straighter and exclaimed, Good, looking forward to it. Malachi said nothing for a moment. May I ask you something personal? Satcha said. You may ask, Malachi returned. Do you have a family? Someone to spend the holiday with? Malachi politely smiled. Yes. Satcha smiled as well. Good. I'm glad to hear. Malachi moved around in his chair. He was fumbling through the pockets of his large tweed overcoat. What emerged was a small box that was placed upon the surface of the wooden table. Malachi pushed it toward his young apprentice. What is this? Satcha inquired suspiciously. Open it. Satcha looked at him. He opened the box and saw the face of a Swiss watch. It had a simple yet ornate face, silver-edged with a nice saddle-brown band. Sasha was left silent for the moment. Put it on, Malachi softly demanded. Sasha looked at him still, and Malachi's face went a little puzzled. Slowly, he reached over and pulled the watch out and helped to attach it to the young man's wrist. Sasha admired it for a few long moments. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, Malachi said slowly. Sacha sighed. I have nothing for you. Malachi rose from his chair and came to stand next to Sacha, still seated. He patted the boy's shoulder robustly. It's a token of my appreciation. And besides, it's the holidays. Next year I expect something nice. Malachi chuckled and went to exit the room. He stopped short and turned around. Remember, February the 8th, okay? Sacha turned to him. He nodded. Malachi was gone. At that moment, Sacha felt himself beginning to love that old bear of a man. The advisor. One. It was 2.08 a.m. when Sacha heard his beeper go off. He lived with that damn thing now. Did everything with it, obsessed with it, because up until now, it had never gone off. It had never buzzed and rattled and moved around like a little black vibrating machine that meant this was his arrival. He grabbed it, pressed the side button to quiet it, and just glared at the numbers written across the light green screen. He rolled out of bed and picked up the telephone. It was a secure line. He dialed the extensive numbers, and a woman answered the call on the third ring. She stated in a thick Russian accent, 
Block 3. Second floor. Room 5. Sacha knew what this meant. He had been given a map of the city, a colored map, written in code as to where he would have to go in case he was called day or night. He got dressed quickly, went downstairs, and landed on the street. He climbed into the 1987 Citroen CX-5 he had been given and started it up. He then went through the gears and rode out into the quiet streets of Moscow. He arrived at the Block 3 building, parking the car many yards away, locked it up, and went walking on foot until he came to the entrance. Two dark figures stood just inside the doubled glass doors, and they allowed him inside with no question. Sacha entered the stairwell and climbed the rises until he landed on the second floor. He looked around and walked down the hallway and saw a door. It had a single painted letter on the glass, marked number five. His knuckles wrapped on glass. The door was suddenly brought open, and a woman in her forties, dressed in a pantsuit, came to face him. She grabbed him by the elbow and slid him into a side room by themselves. She let go of him and got straight in his face. Are you Agent Zero? She inquired. Sacha could smell stale cigarettes on her breath, mixed with vodka and tonic. Yes, he said simply. You have ten minutes alone with her, the woman explained frankly. We feel that she's become a double agent for MI5. We need to know if this has happened immediately. Time is of the essence. I understand, Sacha confirmed. He was then escorted into a small room. There was a single overhead bulb. This woman, he saw, was handcuffed to a steel chair, bolted to the floor. He was allowed to sit down on a fold-out chair beside her. Once he was inside and sat down, the steel door closed behind them. Sacha smelled urine and cigarettes. He remained silent for a few moments, then stated, you're going to have to be honest with me. The woman lifted her head and looked straight at Sacha. They had beat on her pretty good. Her left eye on the brow ridge was cut and turning purple. Her right nostril had bled, and the line of blood had gone dark and started to coagulate against her skin. If Sacha had to guess, she was normally a pretty woman. What is your name? She croaked. Sacha smiled. I'm Agent Zero. She chuckled with discomfort. You are one of them. I've heard of your kind. Have you? Sacha probed. Just tell me the truth. I have been faithful to the motherland, she croaked. Is that what I tell them? Sacha replied. We are all one. She breathed. Then her head fell down against her chest. Sacha touched her hand softly. He could feel the vibrations, the mixed feelings of guilt and fear, and then the immediate knowledge as to why she did what she did. The British had gotten to her over three years ago. She was filtering secrets back to the London office. He let go of her hand, and she suddenly looked up at him. Her eyes were pleading. Why? He asked softly. To help save us all, she said. Sacha looked at her, serenely. He got up and knocked on the door. It opened quickly and he was rushed back to the woman in the pantsuit. Her face was in his again. Her dark eyes imploring him. Tell me, she insisted. Sacha suddenly felt ill. London got to her three years ago, he stated. Good work, the woman said, and then she barked orders in Russian. Suddenly, a man entered the room where the woman was being held. Sacha turned and looked. A loud explosion erupted. A single gunshot, the tinkling of the shell hitting the floor, and then silence everywhere. The slight smell of sulfur, gunpowder, the man exited the room. Sacha stepped forward. 
He reached around to the door opening and stood there. The smell had changed. It was a coppery smell that lingered upward, something he recalled from his youth in Romania. It was the smell of blood when they slaughtered the sheep. Her brains mixed with blood had splattered against the corner wall. Her blonde hair drooped down against her chest. Crimson and blonde melded together and created a ghastly scene. He left the doorway and looked directly at the woman. Am I done here? he asked. Yes, she told him. I will send the report to your superiors. Thank you. He nodded and left the building. Once he got to his car, and he made sure no one was looking, he threw up in heaves and wretches until he had nothing left in his gut. When he got his breath back and the dizziness cleared, he drove back to his apartment and laid awake until the sun rose. 2. How many of your comrades were made to leave the program? Sacha looked at Malachi. They were in the back seat of a large black Land Rover. Snow lit the interior of the back seat, nothing but streaks of white for miles on end. Twelve were made to go, he answered. What do you think happened to them? Sacha frowned a bit, his forehead wrinkled with thought. I'm not sure what you mean, he expressed. Twelve youths of the motherland. What do you think happened to them as a consequence of failing? Sacha remained silent, his eyes focused harder of Malachi's face. Do you think the KGB rewards failure? No, he answered. I wouldn't say they would reward. Punishment for failure, then, Malachi replied. I don't know, Mr. Avon. Malachi sighed. They were brought together and kept together as a group, not allowed to leave in the end like you. The weakest female and the weakest male were made to stand in front of the others. They were shot in the head, as an example. Sacha said nothing. The ride back to Moscow took an eternity. 3. That night they ended up at a small restaurant seated across from each other in a booth. Malachi had ordered them sausage and potatoes. Sacha watched him remove his tweed overcoat and place it on the back of his chair. What remained was the blue suit jacket and white shirt. No tie. Are you upset about the truth? I told you. I've been letting it digest, so to speak. Malachi grinned. Our business is very serious. Ten of them lived. Yes, Sacha said. But you disagree with the method? It is not my place to have an opinion, Sacha replied. Well said for other superiors, but not me. Say how you feel. I want to know. I thought it was extreme. What if I told you that the two that were shot admitted that they just didn't try harder because it was cold. Too cold for them. It was cold. You excelled. The colder it got, the better you got. The two instructors did it. Exactly. You saw what could be done, and you did it. They were just weak, Sacha said softly. There is no place here for weakness, Sacha. What if I fail you, somehow? He wanted to know. Do you feel that you will fail me? Malachi wondered. I will try never to fail, he replied. But sometimes circumstances arise, conflicts occur, obstacles happen. If I fail, even if I explain and try my hardest, will I get shot? No. Malachi answered directly, as long as you are completely honest with me, no. Sacha nodded. Their dinner plates arrived and were placed before them. This sausage is wonderful, best in Moscow. Malachi grabbed his knife and fork. He plainly looked at Sacha. Maybe I shouldn't have told you. But then again, you need to understand. I get it, Satcha said. You don't, 
Malachi corrected. But you need not worry because you have a good character for the job. Sacha looked down at his plate. He picked up a knife and fork and took a piece of the sausage into his mouth. Good, he said. Malachi produced a set of keys and placed them beside his plate. What is this? These are keys to a car and a decent flat that has been appropriated for you. Malachi dropped two cards next to the keys. I want you to go to this institute for a time. A couple of months. It is education and testing for the gift you have. Sacha picked up the cards. He looked at them. Malachi dropped a new black leather wallet next to the keys. Inside the wallet is a credit card with a modest credit limit and some ruble. Thank you, Sacha said slowly. Just buy what you need, groceries, gas for the car, etc. Go to school. It's a normal nine-to-three thing. Go out a bit. Be normal-looking. If you meet someone that is nosy, like a potential girlfriend, tell them you are attending the Moscow University. The name in the wallet will appear there on the student roster. Be smart. Be smart, Satcher replied. Malachi nodded this time and grinned. Because they will test me. Malachi's grin slowly faded. Be smart. And yes, they will test you. Especially the friends. Then the lovers. Four. By mid-May of 1991, Sacha Vasiliev had been in Russia for eight months. He actually liked the city. A lot of the buildings were old. The city had a feel about it, a vibe that settled nice inside of him. Since mid-February, he had been going to the Institute of Science. By now, he had developed a nice routine. He got up around 7 a.m., showered, shaved. He would grab his book bag, drive down the street a couple of blocks, stop by this bagel stand, and grab a roll of steamed bagel and a large coffee and head out. Upon entering the college facade, he had to stop at the gate to the parking lot, show the guard his badge. Then he would be allowed entrance. Once inside, he had to sign the attendance book in the lobby, then head upstairs to his first classes. Sacha liked this time of education. He realized that he was far alone from the mental ability he had acquired. Most of the other students had abilities as well. He was part of a class of 12. The first day he had entered the class, he had silently scoped out the other students and realized the head count, and it made him nervous. Perhaps there was something about this unique number that the organization liked or stuck to. Their headmistress named Helga Smirnov was in her early 50s. She held a pleasant personality, carried on well with her teachings, and engaged with her students on a casual one-on-one -on -one basis. It took Sacha several weeks to engage in light conversation with her. He was reluctant to interact with her until he spoke about it with Malachi. He urged Sacha to open up a little, to allow her to see his potential in order for her to better analyze and utilize his abilities. Five. One afternoon late, when the shadows had begun to emerge against the hallways and in the corners of the classrooms, Mrs. Smirnoff asked Sacha to accompany her to an empty classroom. He could see that she was trying to get him to open up to her. She was a friendly woman, yet he felt something a bit aloof about her. Something she tried to hold secret deep down inside. She sat across from him in front of the teacher's desk. He had taken a wooden chair and awkwardly looked down at the floor as she chatted away. Finally, he interrupted her, almost rudely. What do you really want to know of me? Her conversation was broken. It had lightly startled her. She readjusted and simply asked, I want to know how powerful you are. Sacha lifted his head and gave her a soft stare. I read people, he said read their thoughts. It depends, Sacha began. 
Some are naturally more open. Some have quiet minds. And some scream at me. What about me? You try to hide your pain with a mask. You've created a persona in order to survive. She sat up a little straighter in her chair. You are very blunt, she said. Her voice had grown lower, as if she disapproved. I don't mean to be, he replied. I feel like you are a decent human being, a nice woman. But you've tried very hard to hide the darkness, a child. A moment of silence passed. You lost a child, he told her. She would be grown by now. She was taken by a dark illness with no chance. Helga Smirnov sighed and sucked in a new breath. Almost 20 years ago, my daughter Anna died of a rare brain disease. It destroyed a lot of my life. She is good now, Satya said softly. What? Helga questioned. Satya looked at Helga Smirnov with compassion. She is happy. How would you know that? Satya glanced away. She told me. Am I supposed to believe you? She observed. I don't care if you believe me or not, Satya explained. She said that the man with the mustache will bring you happiness, if you will allow him. Helga Smirnov readjusted her position in her chair. She looked at Satya, carefully, then asked, How powerful are you, really? Satya looked back down to the floor. I'm not sure yet. But I know the date of your death, and I know who you are going to become when you return to this world. Helga Smirnov stood up, bumping the edge of the thick oak desk with her thigh. For a moment, she forgot that she was his teacher, that she held a secretive, prominent position within the most discreet portion of the Russian government. She remained still for moments on end and just breathed in and out, very slowly. I have to admit, I wasn't prepared for you to do a reading on me, on my personal life. I'm sorry if my candor shocked you, he apologized. She remained still, almost cautious, because he had caught her so off guard with his words. Have you known these things about me all along, since you've been here? No, he answered honestly. I didn't have any idea. I just thought you were friendly. Helga slowly allowed herself to sit back in the chair. Satya looked up finally. His soft blue eyes looked at her serenely, with a bit of compassion. You said, what about me? She thought about it. Internally, she agreed with him. I did, didn't I? He nodded. So, if you focus intently, you can zoom in on a person? Yes. He agreed. Kind of like that. And you can control it? She said aloud. Live normally until you desire to focus on a subject? He nodded. Unless their minds are loud, or their emotions are consuming their minds on a constant basis. Helga tried to smile, but it went flat. She cleared her throat nervously. I've been teaching or guiding students here since the late 70s. It's my job to evaluate the students that come here and give recommendations to my superiors as to the best placement for your career. I feel like you already know where you are going. Am I right? He continued to look at her gently. Yes, I know what's going to happen to me. This time, she smiled genuinely. For my curiosity, how are you going to best serve humanity? Satya's eyes grew a little dark. His face went a little flaccid, and he decided to turn away before he answered her. I will complete many missions for the motherland, but my greatest contribution to humanity won't occur for another thirty. Five years. What happens in thirty? Five years, Satya? You shouldn't ask me that question, Mrs. Smirnov. There was a moment of silence between them. Finally, she whispered, I swear I will never say a word to another living soul. Satya looked at her, seriously. 
His face looked different. It now held the expression of an older man, as if he had changed and he had aged a decade. Give me your hand, he demanded. Helga relaxed her right wrist and gazed at it for a second, as if she was contemplating the idea of giving it over to be chopped off for stealing. She allowed her hand to drop to the top of the desk. He grabbed it and gingerly squeezed her palm with his fingers. He let go and suddenly sighed hard. You have my trust, he exclaimed. I believe you. Thank you, she said softly. Human beings will become infected with a virus that will turn them into a different kind of creature. It will begin in the year 2022 and last for nearly five years. Oh my God, she muttered. Gracefully, you won't be here to witness it, Sacha explained. You will be with Anna by the time it begins. Helga Smirnoff looked at her student. Her face had gone slack, and her expression was a mixture of pure astonishment and horror. Would you like for me to take this information away from your mind now? He offered gently. Her jaw dropped ever so slightly. Her eyes swished from side to side as if some grand thought had generated itself inside her brain. Have we ever had this conversation before? Yes, Sacha answered. Twice, as a matter of fact. Evidently, my subconscious doesn't want to go through life knowing. She mumbled and put her fingers to her lips. I understand, Sacha said. A minute later, he stood up gathered his backpack and slung it on his right shoulder. He casually walked out of the classroom and left her alone, seated in front of her desk, her face peering forward, her eyes focused on nothing but the existence of space within the room. The year, 1999. One. The house that Sacha Vasilyev acquired was large, old, ornate, and well-kept. It had been built in 1891, during the reign of Tsar Nicholas II. Wealth had accumulated among the mightiest of industrialists, and no expense was spared with the construction of this three-story mansion. It held three gardens, a swimming pool, and a three-bay enclosed garage that had been its only addition since initial construction. Although Sacha never officially owned the house, it was sanctioned to him, along with many nice amenities, such as a Ferrari, a Mercedes-Benz, and a black Land Rover. He had now gathered a sizable savings of almost six million rubles due to the extensive aid he had given the Russian government over the last decade. He had Malachi Avon to thank for the delicate negotiations between administrators and the formerly known KGB. It was now called the FSK. It was mid-morning on July 5th, when the jury came to visit. Sacha liked calling them the jury, because he now called the meetings at the mansion once a week, when the administrators of intelligence felt the need to be ensured that they had one of the world's greatest psychics on their side. They met in the library. It was one of Sacha's favorite rooms in the house, walled with an elaborate and extensive array of books some probably dating back to the early 1800s and desperately needing to be housed in a museum of history. It had become the sensible place to hold these meetings. In the center of the room was a very large and long polished mahogany table. The place setting held 14 occupants and just for entertainment. Sacha always sat at the head of the table and posed for the part. Six administrators four men and two women dressed in pants suits and ties came inside and sat down formally malachi avon was the last to enter and always two guards in black and green military uniform stood in the corners silently what is your impression of this why 2k situation one asked aloud sacha leaned forward then relaxed back in his chair you mean what do I see in the future, once the clock ticks over and it becomes the year 2000? 
Yes, the man grunted. I see nothing to come of it, Satya explained. Most of the major countries of the world have been planning a corrective strategy for nearly two years now. Do you see any attacks arising by accident due to miscalculations? Another arose. No, I do not, Satya claimed. I have meditated on this subject extensively, and I do not foresee any major conflicts or accidental occurrences happening to threaten our motherland. There were murmurs amongst the jurors, and Satya took a second to glance at Malachi. He was grinning. Is there anything else? Satya stood up and peered down at those who now looked up at him, their faces just the tiniest bit fearful. Malachi stepped forward and announced, I think this meeting has adjourned. Thank you all. Very slowly, the members of the jury gathered their files, their briefcases, and themselves, and slowly vacated the library. Malachi lingered, stepping around the face of the table and finally finding a chair near to where Satcha sat comfortably. He waved a hand at the guards, and they too meandered out of the room and the doors were closed for them to have a private chat. Satcha smiled. How have you been? Malachi asked. Bored out of my mind. Satcha chuckled. Well, I may have a little bit of adventure for you, Malachi explained. What? What? Malachi let out a deep, long sigh. Do you know anything about the Nine? The Nine? Satcha retorted. Malachi chuckled. He stood up and looked down at his apprentice, lovingly. Do you trust the old man? Satcha stood up and gave Malachi a big bear hug. He let go of him and stood there. I don't care. When do we leave? Tomorrow, Malachi explained. He looked down at his thick wrist. I have errands to run. I'll be back tomorrow around noonish. He smiled, then left the room suddenly. Satcha stood there alone for a moment, then suddenly felt relieved. Two. The sky was hazy the next day when Malachi and Satcha entered the fuselage of the White Falcon 2000S. They were both instructed to fasten their seatbelts before takeoff by a lovely stewardess with jet black hair and a long pair of athletic legs. The Falcon's pilot and co-pilot remained unseen and stayed forward in a closed cabin. As soon as they reached a flying altitude of 10,000 feet, the lovely stewardess gently explained that they could unbuckle their belts, and then she asked them if they cared for any drinks. Malachi was in a good mood, and he seemed particularly charming when he indicated that two gin and tonics with a slice of lime would be very appreciated. Satcha sat across from his keeper, legs crossed at the ankles, and he looked at the old man. Where are we going? London, Malachi said, sweetly. He then sipped from the highball glass and placed it on the fold-out table. That separated them. What do you know about remote viewing? A lot, Satcha indicated, then drank from his own glass. I thought we could try something. Malachi continued with his charming voice still intact. I'd like you to meet with two other visionaries at the Rosewood in London. They are working on a project that started back in 1952 in the United States. I understand, Satya said, quietly. Malachi got up and ambled away from his leather chair. After a few moments, he returned and placed a folded package upon the desk. It's the dossier on the event. He said, a bit serious on note, at least the most information we could gather on the history. Satcha looked at him curiously. Remote viewing has been minimally successful. You want me to try at this? We have a few hours. Please read the dossier, he demanded nicely. Satcha grabbed his glass and the messy folder of papers and got up off the chair and walked down the narrow hall of the plane until he found a quiet nook. He scrunched himself into the corner of the wall couch and began to read. 3. The flight was pleasant. No jarring turbulence. 
They landed at Heathrow Airport, London, and was picked up by a private car that led them through the streets until they disembarked at one of the largest hotels Satcha had ever seen. He and Malachi had said little after their drinks and the red of the dossier. He sensed that his keeper had become anxious during the car ride over. Finally, as the doorman opened the rear doors to their car, did he decide to speak? What did you think of it? Satya came around the rear of the car and stood at the entrance and peered upward. God, I love architecture. Malachi stood next to him and gently squeezed his arm. I'm being serious. Satya looked at him. What are you worried about? Information is power, he said. Let's just meet these people and see what they have to say, Satya offered. If I think it's bullshit, I will tell you. Relax. They entered this grand facade of a structure, and Satya was enthralled with the interior walls, the brass railings, an extreme mixture of styles that included an intricate display of colors and glass. He meandered around the lobby as Malachi dealt with their accommodations at the front desk. A bellboy escorted them into the elevator, having toted their luggage onto a silver trolley of sorts that stood upright and could be rolled around easily. Sacha stood there alongside of Malachi in the elevator and sensed immediately how much this thin young man worried about his mother's health condition. They were going to the fourth floor, and after they reached the level, the doors opened and the bellboy escorted the two men to suite 497. The young man in uniform used a key card and swiped the lock handle. He opened the door and entered first, bringing in their luggage and introduced the men to their conjoining suites. He was professional and courteous and asked them if they needed any further assistance before leaving. Sacha took the young man out in the hallway and produced a roll of British money he had on a clip from his right pants pocket. He handed the bellboy 20 pounds. Thank you, sir. Sacha leaned forward against his ear and said softly, your mom will be all right in about six months. The bellboy's expression went a bit cold. Satya held a finger to his pursed lips, as if to say, stay quiet. The bellboy didn't move. Satya smiled a little. I'm a seer of things. Okay, the bellboy muttered. He then quickly nodded and then scurried away, leaving Satya to stand in the hallway alone. Four. After a nice shower and a shave and a change of clothes, Malachi and Sacha left their suite and casually ended up in the downstairs restaurant and lounge. Malachi explained that they were to meet with two scientific researchers and two actual mediums at eight o'clock sharp at the bar. This was said to Sacha as he walked with Malachi down to the elevator doors. Sacha pushed the button and looked at Malachi. You talk to the science guys. I want to talk to the two mediums, especially the woman. The woman? Malachi questioned. Yes, she's blonde. Name starts with an S-E. Malachi had a look of mild shock written on his face. You know this already. Sacha nodded. The elevator's doors opened and they stepped inside. Malachi sighed once the doors shut them inside the closed quarters. Sometimes I forget how good you really are at what you do. I already know what's potentially going to happen. What is that? We'll be staying in London for a little while. Five. Sancha took lead once they entered the Holborn dining room. The dining furniture was upholstered in scheme of a soft tomato red color. The chairs, three-quarter high, held the same seated color with dark cherry legs. The bar was rectangle, slick and elegant. Above their heads, golden bars of opaque light gave the evening a warm feeling. Five persons were seated at the bar, but Satcha felt the glow from just one. Just as Satcha was in five feet of approach, the woman with shoulder-length blonde hair abruptly swiveled herself around on her chair 
glass of white wine in her right hand. Hello, she said with a smile. Satya stopped. He stood there. The rest of the group turned around. Smiles eventually emerged on their faces, but they weren't genuine. All except hers. My name is Sylvia Jensen, she said in a lovely British accent. She extended her left hand. Sacha took it in his own. Sacha Vasiliev. Pleasure to meet you. This is Connor Epstein, she announced. Sacha shook the man's hand. Sacha turned around and said, This is Malachi Avon. The other two gentlemen, Edward Miles and Colin, Evely shook hands with both Malachi and Sacha. Would you mind if we initially have a word with Satya at one of the dining tables? She said to one of her advisors. A nod was given, and she smiled graciously and allowed herself out of the bar stool and decidedly made her way to a table that suited her taste. Connor and Satya followed her over and sat down and got comfortable. She and Connor had glasses of white wine. Sylvia waved over a member of the waiter staff. What would you care to drink? She asked him. I'll have a Chardonnay, he announced. Sylvia just looked at him. She sighed happily. We've heard some things about you. Fairy tales, I assure you. She nodded. Connor Epstein asked, Do you know why you have been asked to come? I read a dossier on the flight over. I assume it's about making history repeat itself. Connor Epstein turned to look at Sylvia. He's not taking this serious. Sylvia continued to gaze at Satya. Yes, he is. He understands. Thank you, Satya expressed. My attempt at humor is a bit dry. We would like to include you in on a series of experiments we have been conducting for the last three months, Sylvia explained. We have made contact with something. Extraordinary, Connor exclaimed. Well, what is it? The Nine, Satya asked bluntly. This is an extremely secretive thing we're doing here, Sylvia began. Instead of, uh, labeling it, we'd rather you have a try. Like I said, we've heard some things about you and we are grateful that you've agreed to have a conversation with us. Satya smiled at them both. No, the pleasure is mine. Six. Due to security and Malachi's insistence, a private car was sanctioned for Satya's trip to the experimental laboratory in Stevenage, a borough in the heart of Hertfordshire. He was allowed to travel the 29 miles from London to the facility if he was accompanied by two bodyguards. Two days later, Satya gave in and allowed this to happen. He argued quite extensively with his keeper, but in the end, he gained a higher understanding of how deeply the FSK had their hooks in him, and if he ever wanted to see Sylvia Jensen again, he would have to comply. So, he did. Saturday morning, July 10th, Sacha took the car north. He also demanded that the two guards stay quiet and stay distant as possible from his presence. Watching the landscape change as they left North London, he was uniquely intrigued by the deep green fields that seemed to roll out like a lush green blanket. The motorway seemed narrower than he was used to, and it was lined with fencing, wooden, and then stone in most cases. It was a pleasant, quiet drive to this village. When Satya was allowed out of the car and stood in front of the building, he was curious for a moment. Then the idea of what they had created was near genius. The building was probably a school, at one point in its history, made of stone and tall windows and doors. It looked sturdy and robust. It was a secret that stood proudly in a quaint village. A place in passing, normal, a village school that housed the secrets of spies. He loved it. The two guards escorted him to the front entrance, and a security guard opened the thick wire screen door and waited.
Such a Vasiliev to see Mr. Miles and Mr. Everly, the first bodyguard announced. They were allowed in once proper identification cards, and IDs were viewed. All three had to sign a docket. And soon after a brief wait, Edward Miles came down from a hallway and greeted the men with a smile. Good day, gentlemen. Welcome to our facility. He was a slender man, well-dressed for the day, dress slacks, casual tie and shirt and sweater in his late fifties. Standing there for a long moment, he addressed his own security to show the private Russian guards the building and then the perimeter of the grounds. A minute later, Satya stood alone with the professor and said humorously, Thank you for that. They've been glued to my hip since London. We understand security and secrets, Mr. Vasiliev. Please call me Satya. Satya. Edward Miles smiled. Edward, for me, is fine. Hopefully, we can get you settled in, and we can have a bit of time to chat. Mr. Everly will join us later. Satya nodded. Professor Edward Miles brought him upstairs to the second level and showed him his private guest room. It was a quaint room, painted white, a single bed, a chair and table, a bookshelf filled, and a small bathroom. He explained that he would have his luggage brought up later, and he would like Satya to join him and the others in the basement. Two flights of stairs downward, Satya immediately felt the cooler temperature. He followed the professor down a dim hallway from the landing, and they emerged in a large recreation room of sorts. It was lit with fluorescent lighting from the ceiling. They turned left and went forward, until he saw a sitting area. Sacha saw three familiar faces. Two were crawled up on the furniture like lazy coeds hanging out between classes at a university. The third, Colin Everly, was sitting alone. When they saw Sacha approach with the professor, they all sat straighter, as if drawn to attention. Don't get uncomfortable on my account, Sacha declared with a slight grin. Sylvia Jensen looked up at Satya as he approached, her pale blue eyes steadfast on his. Glad you decided to join us. Satya turned around, and he found a single leather chair and flopped into it. He smiled. I have no real idea of what research you are doing. I read a report on an experiment done almost fifty years ago. Professor Miles scooted a rocking chair around to the front of the group and sat down. He cleared his throat and announced, All of us here have top-secret clearance. We all have keepers. None of us here are fools. We now have three different government agencies working together on a single project. He stopped for a moment and pulled out a pipe from his sweater pocket and decidedly began lighting it with a pale blue Bic lighter. Once he obtained smoke, he continued, I don't care about politics. I care about the results that we may acquire. Satya looked around the group. Finally, he asked, What is the goal of this experiment? To make contact, Miles answered. With whom? Colin Everly slowly stood up and looked at Satya. In the 1950s, a doctor in parapsychology began a series of experiments using trance mediums to contact anything intelligent out there. He raised his arms a bit, jesting to the ceiling. He brought them down abruptly and returned his gaze upon Satya. It was said that they were haphazardly successful. Okay, Satya breathed. Many early findings were hazed with credibility issues due to the nature of the original doctor. Professor Miles broke in. The stable credibility came from the notes of the invited guests. One in particular. It was the year 1959. Have you heard of Calvin Kellingsworth? Satcha shook his head. Everly continued. He was a bright kid at Yale University and happened to find himself invited to one of these secret sessions. Evidently, he made a pretty impression on the doctor. Professor Miles announced. In the mid-sixties, he created a television series called 
in the realm beyond. The series, which only ran for four years, has been syndicated across the globe. It has a cult following, and several movies have been adapted from the series. I've heard of it, Satya admitted. Seen the movies. They're good. Kellingsworth was kind enough to share most of his notes with the CIA in America. A few years before he passed away, Colin Everly stated, In his statement, a particular trance medium was able to contact a singular member of what they call the Nine. Yes, Professor Miles said and went on. They call themselves the Nine Principles of the Universe. Who are they? Exactly, Satya asked. Deities, perhaps. Everly broke in. It's difficult to champion the definition. It was written and described that these beings were, or overseers, of the universe. Sacha sat up straighter and turned to Colin and Sylvia. Have you two made contact? Sylvia smiled a little. She brought her hand over to grasp Colin's, and they sat there together on the leather couch like two lost schoolchildren. We made contact with one entity only. She stated slowly, Um, that's what it called itself, and it told us we needed a third member to continue a dialogue. Satya looked at them curiously. So you see our dilemma? Professor Miles announced. Satya suddenly saw that all of them were gazing at him. What? He implored suddenly. Will you try this with us? Sylvia asked. Could I at least get lunch first? He wanted to know. Seven. Colin, Sylvia, and Satya sat together in a dining nook in the corner of the basement. They had shepherd's pie, tea, and raspberry pastry for a light dessert. After light conversation during the meal, Satya looked at Connor Epstein and asked where he was from. Neptune, New Jersey, he said softly. The all-American suburbs. I'd like to visit America someday, Satcha said gently. You will, Connor said, and stood up. Please excuse me. I have to make a phone call. Please carry on without me. Satcha and Sylvia sat at the dining table and watched silently as he made his way out of the basement. After a moment, Satcha exclaimed, He doesn't like me much. Have I done something to offend him? Sylvia shook her head. It takes him a long time to warm up to people. I've known him for three years now. The first year we were together, he barely said hello to me. Are you too close now? Sylvia lowered her head and grinned at him mischievously. Are you trying to ask if we are lovers? Satcha suddenly looked down at the table, cleared his throat a little, and claimed, no. Just wondering if you two were really good friends now. She chuckled a little. Good friends, yes. Lovers, no. Yes. Of course. He stood up from the chair and stretched his legs. Sylvia stood up as well. Let's go out to the back garden and talk a little more. Eight. Behind the facility lay a good three-quarter acre lawn, enclosed on all sides with tall white fencing. It was broken up in sections with garden plots, surrounded with stone borders and a few nice trees to give shade. They decided to sit down at the concrete patio, under the shade of a silver birch tree. Early afternoon sunlight touched her face at times and lit up the ends of her blonde hair. Where did you come from? Satya asked. And why are you here? I was born and raised in the borough of Kettering she answered nicely. A community not far from here. I was raised in Romania, Satya smiled. And now Russian? I was almost eighteen when I took the train to Russia. Satya chuckled. He shook his head in disbelief. Feels like such a long time ago. Why did you go? Satya's smile faded. It was a calling. Something I couldn't ignore. A light breeze stirred the leaves on the birch tree. Her face changed, re-emerged, 
glistened and calmed a little differently. Were you born with it? Satcher shook his head. I was in an accident. I died. When I woke up weeks later, I knew everything that was impossible to know after. You died, and you remember all of it. He nodded slowly. Fascinating, she exclaimed. When I was five years old, I told my mum who I had been in the life previous to this one. Did she believe you? Oddly, she listened to me and didn't try to dismiss me. She was open to it, you know. That's good, Sacha said quietly. My own mother heard me as well. For a good minute, they sat in a comfortable silence. The sun shone warmly and the afternoon breeze glided over their faces and whisked their hair. It's quite the extraordinary day, isn't it? She offered. When do they want to start? He questioned. Tomorrow, if you are up for it, she answered. I've never done remote viewing to outer space before, he expressed honestly. Neither had I, she spoke. I was asked, like you, to try. What exactly did you make contact with out there? He asked directly. She smiled. I don't know. I go into a semi-conscious trance, and they record what I say. I have no recollection of it at all. Much like Edgar Case. Sacha frowned slightly. Oh, I see. I've done it directly. Precisely, she said solidly. Like I said, we've heard things. Sacha shook his head. Why haven't I heard of you or Connor before? He inquired. Sylvia paused for a moment before giving her version of an answer. No, disrespect implied. But you are a well-kept Russian secret for a reason. Connor and I work for MI5, and you for the FSK. Politics and secrets prevail. Plus, we weren't escorted with two private guards. No disrespect taken. Satch aside. You're probably more valuable than you realize, she said. Evidently, they want this project to come to fruition more than we realize, he said. 9. 11. 38 p.m. Sacha heard three small knocks at his door. He got up out of the single bed and stepped to his door. His heart was beating a little harder when he cracked the door and saw her face. He opened the door, and she was standing there in an ivory silk robe and nightgown. May I come in? she whispered. He opened the door wider and stepped to the side. She entered silently, and he quickly closed the door. Satcha stood there. He said nothing. He suddenly knew. I could hear you thinking about me from down the hall, she stated just above a whisper. You could, huh? he asked. Yes, she answered. I liked your energy from the first time we met. Sacha smiled a little. You are a stunningly beautiful woman he confessed. And yes, I haven't been able to stop thinking about you. She drew her face closer to his and gingerly touched his lips with her own. He embraced her and pulled her body close to his own, her full breasts soft and warm. He could feel across his bare chest through the slick material of her nightgown. Suddenly and instinctually, he slid her robe off her shoulders, and within a crisscross of her arms, she was naked, except for a pair of delicate laced panties. They kissed each other's bodies and fell into the single bed until the time came when he entered her. They moved rhythmically together, silently knowing that their bodies had found a natural match until he released his seed inside of her. Sometime later, they fell asleep, spoon and spoon, warm, comfortable, and happy. Ten. He opened his eyes. Mid-morning light lit the walls of the small guest room. He suddenly felt alone, and he sat up in the bed 
and felt the absence of the pajama shorts he had gone to bed with. He smiled. Memories of her sweet, natural body and her scent, and he being inside of her, flooded his mind for a pleasurable moment. He took his watch from the bedside table. It read a quarter past eight. After showering and dressing in a comfortable pair of jeans and one of his favorite cotton pullover shirts, he opened his door to find one of the guards standing there. Been standing there all night? Sacha asked sharply. The guard looked at Sacha with distaste. I'm just doing my job. Sacha turned away and headed down the hall and down the two flights of stairs. He entered the basement and found his fellow clairvoyant seated at the dining table. Sacha took a seat at the table and poured himself a cup of coffee. Morning, he said a bit cheerfully. How did you sleep? Sylvia asked sweetly. I find my first stay at a strange place, a little hard to get comfortable in. Once I nestled in, I slept wonderfully. Connor cleared his throat a little. You indicated that you wanted to begin today. Sacha nodded. He grabbed a Danish from a platter and poked it into his mouth. He started chewing. All of this is handled in a pretty relaxed approach, Sylvia explained. Connor rose from the table and took his last sip of coffee. I'm going to go on up to the third floor, get some stretches in before we begin. In a few moments, Sacha and Sylvia were alone, sitting across from one another. How did you get past my guard last night? Sacha whispered. Sylvia smiled devilishly. She tilted her head to the side playfully. Whatever do you mean, Mr. Vasiliev? Sacha sighed and chuckled, realizing she liked to play. I really enjoyed last night. Did you? She teased and then rose. She paused for a moment, gazing into his light blue eyes, then said, come to the third floor when you're done. We'll see you there. Sacha nodded. He watched her body as she walked away. He grinned.